Okay. Well, good morning. Um, I, it's such a privilege to be up here, and last week, Patricia, wow, got us started, and I have to say it's a little humbling coming up here after Patricia was teaching, but we'll do the best that we can. And Patricia did a great job of introducing us to Peter last week, and we saw him go from fisherman to disciple, and I keep thinking of the words that she was saying that Jesus said to Peter and the disciples and also to us to repent, to believe, and to follow. So to this week, we're going to look at an interaction that Jesus has with Peter and the other disciples. And we're going to see how this impacts his faith. And it can also really impact our faith, too, as I was studying this. And we're going to stay with the same format that we did last week, just in case you weren't here, is I'm going to talk just a little while. We're going to read some scripture together. You'll have some time to look at that scripture together as a, as a table and talk about it. Then we'll come back and I'll talk a little bit more. Then we will go and have some scripture meditation at the end and then I'll pray. So just to let you know if you weren't here last week. Now, Peter has been called, been called as a disciple. We're going to be looking in Matthew 16. And he has experienced a lot of miracles being with Jesus. He was there when Jesus did his very first miracle. He turned water into wine. He saw him feed thousands of people. He saw him do healings, even Peter's own mother-in-law. So he's getting to know who Jesus is. And then Jesus asked them a question he says to them, who do people say that I am? And we're going to look at the, at the answers that the disciples gave. But I started thinking, okay, suppose you went to Short Pump Mall and you said, started asking people, you know, who's Jesus? And you'd get all sorts of answers, I'm sure. I mean, you might say, oh, you know, his guy lived a long time ago, or he was a great teacher. Or somebody might even say, well, he was the son of God. But... It's, it's interesting that on, I love in, in her book, on page 20, you might want to write page 20 down, there was a great quote Patricia had by C.S. Lewis. And he talks about if Jesus was really who he says he was, or either he was a complete lunatic. So look at that if you have time at your table, because I thought it really was a really insightful paragraph. Well, so Jesus asked them that, but then he turns it personally and he says, but who do you say that I am? And as I was talking to Patricia about this, she made a really good point. She said, what kind of tone is Jesus using when he asks that? Is he saying, and who do you say I am? Like he's going to catch them up, like if they're wrong. Or is it, who do you say that I am? More, I am trying to draw you in so you can have a relationship with me. So we ask that question, and then Jesus, you're going to see Peter answers it correctly. I'm not going to tell you what he said, but he did answer it correctly. And then Jesus turns around and says a very important biblical truth that we all have to have to really think about today and that is that the only way Peter could answer that question correctly was because God showed him that answer and the biblical truth is everyone's faith starts with God and some people might say well wait a minute I thought this was a choice it's a great mystery but I will say that you have met people who you've shared about Jesus and you feel like you're talking to a brick wall. And then you share with someone else and they'll say, oh, all of a sudden I knew God loved me and I wanted a relationship with him. And it's all because of the Holy Spirit has been at work. And I think this is really freeing when we're trying to share with someone that we love, but you can tell that they don't really understand what you're saying and so to me the best advice I can give you if you have friends or family like that is to pray first love them and then pray that
that the Holy Spirit will do his work. And, you know, you, it takes the pressure off of you having to have the perfect gospel presentation and saying the perfect thing. Because believe me, none of us are going to say it perfectly. And trust that God can do that. You know, in Ethiopia, I loved it because many of the Muslim people that we met at our sports camp some would say, you know how to dream. And Jesus came to me in that dream. And he told me he was the son of God. So I woke up and I knew that I knew. And I thought, wow, because, you know, we don't hear that so much over here. So God can do anything to touch people. I've even heard of moms praying for their kids and the kids saying somebody came up to him in the grocery store and said, I just want you to know Jesus loves you very much. God told me to come over and say that to you. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's just so cool to see how God works. So just be encouraged about that. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to stand together and we're going to read Matthew 16, verses 13 through 26. I think they're going to put it up on the screen. And you have it on your sheet. Okay? It's kind of long, but I felt like we really kind of had to have it all to, to make, get the point to the lesson. Okay. I'll read. You read with me. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you want to be my follower." You must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit from gaining the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Okay, that's a lot of scripture. So I gave you some questions to help you focus. I'm going to give you about like seven minutes. I'll be looking around to see when I think you're finished, and then we'll come back.
Okay, I know that was a lot of scripture and you might not have gone through all the questions, but we'll move along. And if you have time, you can come back to them. Um, I just want to say I was really excited when we were going to be doing this study on Peter because he's one of my favorite Bible characters. And I think that because he's like, I think he had ADD kind of like I do. He's all over the place and impulsive and just kind of a mess, very much like me. And when he gives Jesus this answer, who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus is like, yes. And what you have just stated, Peter, is what I'm going to build my church on. And so that's what our Christian faith is built upon. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, and he's the Messiah. So if I was Peter, I would probably be saying, feeling pretty good about myself. I'd be going, okay. You know, even though Jesus just said it was only because I knew because of God, I'd still be thinking, guys, you know, me and God, we've got this direct, that direct line going. So he's probably like just waiting for the next question or listening up. And then the next thing that happens is Jesus starts talking about, okay, here's how things are going to go down. And Jesus is like, Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, we can't have it happen like that. And he rebukes Jesus. And Jesus is not having it. I mean, what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. And so here, how humbling. You go from giving the answer that the church is going to be built on to being saying that your words are from Satan, the liar, the deceiver. And I just thought, wow. Jesus really shut that down. When Peter thinks he knows better or doesn't want the plan that Jesus has, he's not going to listen to Peter's plan. And remember, Peter, his thoughts of who the Messiah was going to be were not anything like what Jesus was going to be. He thought he was going to be a warrior. He was going to lead the Jews against the Roman occupation. And that's not at all what Jesus was going to do. But Jesus had no idea that the hard plan was going to be quadrillion times better than Peter's plan. And so this exchange when Jesus has said, get behind me, Satan, has always, it's just kind of bothered me. And I was like, oh. Mm. But it's been good that I've had to sit with this through this lesson. And I started thinking about when I pray. And I've been really convicted about this lately because when I'm honest, you know, Jesus, when he taught his disciples to pray, one of the big things he said is your kingdom come, your will be done. And that has always made me go, "Mm, I don't know if I can say that. Instead, what I'm really saying is, my kingdom come. And here's the deal, Lord. This is how it's going to work. And if you just do it like X, Y, and Z, then, you know, my family's going to be so happy and life is going to be good. And so many times, you know, I don't have the wisdom that God has. And why can I not say your kingdom come, your will be done? And I know it's fear. I'm afraid that God is going to do something in my life that's going to be hard, and I don't want that, even if it's for my best. And all of us know little kids are like that. You you know, you ask your parents for something, and they say, no, you know, you you can't have that. But you know it's because it's not good for them. And it's just the same way. We we have a loving father. And, you know, I I just did a, a Bible study on prayer, And it had different Bible studies teachers on it. One was Jen Wilkin. And she, God really used this in my life because she she asked the question, she was, how much does God know? And, you know, of course, everybody would say, well, he knows everything. And the theologians call this omniscient. But do you really, really think about that? That he is the ultimate expert on everything. Jesus knows everything macro. Like, he knows way beyond the Hubble telescope that we're able to see. And he knows everything 
micro, the smallest atoms in cells. He made them. He understands them all. He knows everyone's thoughts and their intentions. And he knows everything in the universe. And he's, one thing that you can't do to God is teach him something. Because he already knows it all. He's also eternal. So he's not limited by time. So he knows everything in the past, present, and future. So when I am thinking about this, I am not going to trust the person that knows all the facts. He knows everything, all the nuances of every relationship. He knows the millions and millions of details that I have no clue about. So this is one of the things that you're going to be talking about today is, do you, can, you, can you say that? Your will be done. And I'm going to give you an example in a little bit of a time when I didn't want his will to be done, but I did get a glimpse of something he was doing. But I want us to look at, at verse 25 for a minute. In this verse 25, Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And I just heard um, author John Mark Cromer talking about this verse. And he said, you know, this is not a command Jesus is giving. It's a statement of reality. If you try to hang on, then you will lose it. And so we spend our energy, all our time, trying to control things. I can't even control my husband's driving. We got in a huge fight yesterday because I was saying, you are driving like an old man. And I, you know, so he pulled over and goes, fine, you drive. So that was, you know, <laughs> not good. So I try to control things that I have no control over. I try to avoid pain. I spend money, energy, all those things because I think I can control things. But the times when I can say, Lord, I can't control this. I'm just going to sit in you and, and, and sit in silence and trust that you are going to take care of this. That is when I begin to find life and life and joy. So a, an example from my own life was 31 years ago, if somebody had said to me, oh, would you like a disabled daughter when you have a you know, third child? I would have said, Absolutely not. No, I can't handle that. You have the wrong person. In fact, I told God all those things. But 31 years later, after many, many things have happened, I would not want my daughter to be any other way than she is. And, I get, and I'm not lying when I say that. So I also realized that God does things through her that, that I don't even know about. And here was my example. We went to Sheets the other day. And she said, we were going to go get a drink. So we were getting in the line, and you know, it can be a long line, and we're just waiting there. And we come up to the cashier, and the cashier is checking us out, and she looks up, and she goes, oh, Allie Page! Allie Page Haynes! Oh, my gosh, I haven't seen you in so long! And Allie Page goes, hi, Courtney. And it was somebody she knew from elementary school. And I went... Courtney, and I remember she is just one of those kids that was just went out of the way to be nice to Allie Page. And she was like, oh, you're my hero. Well, you know, here's this whole long line in sheets. And she goes, I've got to come around and give you a hug. So she comes around, she hugs Allie Page, and Allie Page does this little pat thing on the back, you know, and I was thinking, all these people are waiting. But she's just going on and on and gushing and saying, Allie Page, I wrote a, a paper about you in high school, and I got an A-plus on it. You just made my day. And I was like, oh, that was so sweet. So as we walk out to the car, I get in the car, and I burst that crying. I thought, I have no idea what, what you're doing, Lord. You're doing things that I have no clue about. But you, the things that you are doing are far better than I could ever dream or imagine. And I know that probably some of you, and you'll have a chance to share this, that maybe sometimes that's happened to you too. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to have a chance to talk about this. And we have some more scriptures. I'm going to give you a longer time. I'm going to give you about 25 minutes 
to talk some more through these questions, and then we'll end with our scripture medication.
Okay, um, I am just so encouraged watching you all, I, I sitting up here and praying for you all and seeing people laughing, some people crying, some people praying. It's just so exciting to see the way God is working in this room. And so the title of our lesson today was, What Do I Want? And so I have to ask myself, and I think we should ask ourselves, do we want to trust the God of the universe to show me the better way? Do I really want to try to keep on controlling the universe with my limited knowledge? Or can I trust him that he has the better plan? You know, Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you can have life and have it to the full. That's the kind of life I know I want. So today I'm going to, the scripture that I chose is going to be out of Proverbs. And it's just two verses. But they're really special to me because it, these are the verses that my husband recited to me the night that Allie was born. I was in a freaking out mood. And he kept... Uh, just uh, over and over again, he kept saying these verses to me. So I, I hope that as I read them, I'm going to read them twice, but I want you to close your eyes and ask the Lord to let these words wash over you and then see if there is a word or a phrase or something that he's saying to you through this scripture. You know, the Bible says that the word is living and active. So we know that these words have a special power to teach us, rebuke us, correct us, and train us in righteousness. Okay. So close your eyes. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. 